consultant, Moon Switch is my company. Um, today we're going to talk about development environments and um, how you can hopefully make yours suck less <laughs> um, using a couple of tools called Docker and Vagrant together. So how many people are familiar with this little seal of approval? Yeah? Uh-huh. We all know this. You, uh, you built it, you checked it in, somebody else pulled it down and said, it doesn't work. Ah, it works on my machine. I don't know what to tell you. Especially if you're doing, uh, <laughs> this was really bad back in like the VB6 days, if you were doing VB6 development, and DLL hell, it was nuts. But it's still a problem even with modern package managers like NuGet for .NET or NPM or using Ruby gems. You've got to have all the right versions of dependencies installed to make your code work. You've got to have all the right environment variables set. And so this becomes a real problem. We've had this one too, right? Oh, well, it worked great on my machine. I don't know why it doesn't work in production. Could it have anything to do with the fact that my machine has a whole different set of stuff installed than what's on the production servers? I don't even know what's on the production servers. The ops guys didn't tell me. They didn't tell me they upgraded this dependency. Or I didn't tell them that I upgraded a dependency. And even if it works on all the dev machines and in your dev environment, all of a sudden, it goes to production and it fails, eh, throw that over the wall, right? It's not my problem. That's ops. You guys go figure it out. So we're all kind of familiar with these situations. And the goal of this uh, presentation is to introduce you to a few tools, namely Docker and Vagrant, that can help unify what your development environment and your production environment look like. I think uh, we could probably all agree that it's absolutely ideal if you're developing in the exact same environment as what your code runs in in production and in test and in QA, wherever else your code has to run. If it's exactly the same, these problems just kind of magically disappear, right? So Docker is a tool that can help you kind of achieve that. Um, quick poll, how many people have uh, heard of Docker? Okay, about three quarters. How many people have used Docker? Yeah, that's, that's pretty common. You hear about it and it sounds awesome because people are like, oh no, it's great. You can just, it's containers that you can just throw your application in and it just works the same everywhere. And then you go look at it and go, what is this? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> that's what I did for a long time when I was looking at it. So I thought I'd help other people try to understand it. So, Docker describes itself as an open platform for, distribution, for distributed applications for developers and sysadmins, right? Um, kind of uh, the DevOps term that people like to throw around, which, uh, by the way, if we have DevOps enthusiasts here, um, everybody else just understand DevOps is an idea. You should not have a DevOps team at your company. I just want to put that out there. It's about two teams working together. And, Docker is one of those tools that can help bridge that DevOps gap so that your developers and your operations people are on the same page. Um, it is built on top of LXC containers, okay? Um, LXC containers are a feature of the newer Linux kernels that allow you to run a process in isolation that's basically like a VM, all right? So an LXC container for, as an analogy, and please, any LXC enthusiasts, don't kill me on this because I know it's not true. It's like a lightweight VM, okay? You can, you're not amiss to think of it as a lightweight VM that you can spin up very quickly and runs the same everywhere else, okay? And as long as you're not deep into LXC containers, you don't have to care that it's not a VM. So let's look at how you actually use Docker in its simplest form, okay? Um, here I've got a, kind of a truncated version of some command line stuff that I ran the other day. Uh, can you guys read that okay? Do I need to make that bigger? No? It's good? Okay. Um, so with the Docker tools installed on my box, I run docker run dash d nginx. Okay? Now this command is saying, hey Docker, I want you to run, the dash d says in daemon mode in the background because I don't want this service just consuming my session. And I want you to run Nginx. Now, 
you'll see down here the next line of output says, well, I couldn't find Nginx container that you referred to locally, so I'm going to go grab it from the default Docker repository out on Docker Hub. And it goes and downloads a bunch of things and ultimately spits me out this big, long hex string of a, uh, an ID for that container. And so now if I issue this command docker inspect, and then I'm going to grep it down for a particular thing that comes out of it, it gives me back the IP address of that docker container, right? Again, it's kind of like a VM. It's got its own networking. It's got its own IP address. Um, and so from here, I'll just run a simple curl IL onto that and say, oh, cool. I got back an HTTP 200, right? So I spun up a container that is running Nginx, that, which is like Apache if you're not familiar with Nginx. Um, and it, by default, it just has a default web page, kind of like any other web server would when you spin it up. And that's all we saw here. So that's the simplest version of running a container, all right? So let's talk a little bit about what happens inside of containers, okay? Um, a container, like I said, it's kind of like a virtual machine, and you define a Docker file that we'll talk about in detail here in just a little bit, um, that says, hey, I want you to start from this base image. Maybe it's uh, Ubuntu or um, or any other Docker container that you want to start your base image from and say, I want you to run and install um, Nginx and Apache and install all these development dependencies that my, or runtime dependencies that my application has. I want you to add some files in there and then I want you, whenever I run this command, I want you to start with a given command that I specify. So in this case, the Nginx server, just Nginx is just running in the, inside the container. And this is all fine and good, but this is, um, if you're looking at this saying, all right, well, you hit a local IP address, how am I going to serve that to people, right? So at this point, what we have is we have a Docker container that's running inside my host machine. And right now, that port that I just pinged or got a uh, HTTP request against is not exposed to anything on the outside world. Only my local host can access it. So let's take a look at another example. Here I'm going to run pretty much the same command, but this time I said, oh, well, dash p 8080. And that basically just tells Docker, hey, map port 80 on my host to port 80 on this container. So now things are getting more interesting. Now I can spin up this container that has all my dependencies inside of it and is all pre-configured and it's, you know, maybe it's been an image that's been security hardened by ops and everything and it's ready to go. And I can spin that up. And now my host machine, whether that's my dev box or maybe that's the actual production server that's hosting these containers, has exposed its port onto this container. So now if our firewall allows a connection through from the outside, I could come and hit some, you know, www.moonswitch.com and it's going to go in here and hit this container, which is going to serve my website. So that gets a little bit more interesting, right? And now we start to see where, okay, great. So I can work in the same container in development as what they're going to run in production. So now we're getting a little bit closer to that kind of ubiquitous build it in the same spot or build it in the same environment. So let's take a look at a little bit more complex example. This one, I'm going to run two containers. So in the first one, I said, docker run dash d. I gave this one a name so I can refer to it easily instead of using that big hex string ID and told it Redis. All right, so this is going to go out and pull this default kind of official Redis image from the Docker Hub registry and spin up a Redis container. And then when I run my container, I'm going to sell it dash dash link some Redis, which is the name that we gave that container and call it Redis inside my container and still map my ports. And I started my own container I built called My Cool Container. All right. Now this, if you look at this, this, this becomes the environment variables that were exposed inside of my container. Okay? And we look at this, and it's a convention-based set of environment variables that says, all right, the name of this linked container is Redis, so it's going to be Redis underscore name. I know what, that it's called Redis because I specified it in the second half of that link command. My machine is going to call this Redis. Uh, and it gives me uh, this 
slightly confusing but very useful environment variable called port, which actually has a full TCP address that you can use in a connection string to connect to a Redis server. Okay? Uh, and then it has parts of that information broken out into separate environment variables if you want to use those. Um, I typically just use Redis port because it's got everything I need right there. So now inside my machine, I can have some code. Maybe I've written a Node.js app in here. Okay? And I can have some code that says, great, uh, fire me up a new Redis connection. You know, I'll require Redis, Redis.createClient, and I'll pass in that environment variable. So this becomes really powerful because at development time, I can link this to any container that has Redis running. Okay? So at development time, maybe I just use this default Redis instance that comes down from the Docker Hub. And that's probably fine for development. But in production, your ops guys are probably like, no, 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 we run Redis in a clustered mode, it's been security hardened, it's got all of these other things that make it ready for production. That's what we run. And you say, okay, I don't care as long as I've got a connection string to that Redis server. So in development, I'm running against this default one. Whenever they run this in, op, in production, they'll run this same command and link it to their Redis container that's running out there in the production environment. And my app doesn't care. It's just exposed via an environment variable, and I can connect to it and talk to it. So now my app has Redis, but I don't have to worry about how to configure Redis and how to install the dependencies and all that stuff. It just says, hey, link these containers together, and it'll just work. So here is a Docker file, OK? Um, and this is actually the Docker file for that Nginx image that I ran. This is the Docker file that actually belongs to that kind of official Nginx image. Now there's a lot going on in here. And if you went down the path of Docker, you probably made it past, yeah, run a container, run this. OK, something's running. I don't know what to do with it. And then somebody somewhere you came across a Docker file, and you looked at this and went, what is all that? <laughs> so the Docker file becomes the kind of map to how your container is built. And it describes all of the contents of your container and the state of your container. OK? So starting at the very top, we see it says, oh, from Debbie and Wheezy. All right? So that means that there is a Docker image out on the Docker Hub repository called Debbie and Wheezy, which is, as you might have guessed, an Ubuntu distribution. Um, now, you can start from your own. You can build a Docker container straight from scratch and have your own internal hardened images inside your company or in a private Docker registry. Um, you can start from whatever point you want to. Um, you can actually start from that Nginx container that we're running, that this file produces, and build your own. I don't necessarily recommend that. It can be a good way to quick start something. For example, in the past, I've used a container that was already pre-configured to run Node.js. So it had Node installed, it had all kinds of stuff going. And so I could just start from there. And I found that it was um, kind of one of those black boxes that I wanted to know more about what was happening inside of it. Right? I wanted to know more about how the install was done, what version of Node was running. I wanted more control over it. So while it can be a great way to kind of ramp up quickly on Docker by starting from these base images that already have a bunch of stuff installed, when you get serious about developing and deploying it to production, I would start from a pretty low level like an Ubuntu distribution and install all your dependencies yourself. So that's what happens here with these run commands that we see um, right starting here. Um, a run command in a Docker file is uh, something that's going to be executed when the container is built, right? The life cycle of a Docker container is you start with a Docker file and maybe some other new files in a directory that you want included in your container. And you run a command called docker build. And it looks at your Docker file and says, all right, I'm going to follow this set of instructions right here in order to build this container for you, OK? Um, so at build time, when you build the container the first time, it's going to run all of these run commands. And as you can see, we're doing some things like, oh, let's add a key for this repository. Let's go ahead and uh, run apt get update, apt get install, and install some dependencies. Um, you can, uh, as you can see here, you can set particular environment variables that you want inside your container. 
Um, and then you can run pretty much any Linux-based command. Here they're doing a, uh, a symlink uh, of the output of standard out and standard error, putting it into a location where uh, Docker can kind of access that. That way you can get that out in your Docker logs. Um, so at build time, all those instructions are going to run. And you're going to end up left with a binary, basically, a binary image that is ready to be run. And when you run an image, that's when this command gets executed. All right? Now, an important thing to note about uh, Docker commands is that a Docker container will exit and stop as soon as your the process in this command argument stops, okay? So if you run something, like let's say you were to uh, start Nginx in daemon mode where it's gonna go straight into the background, that counts as a process that has exited and your Docker container is just gonna stop. And then you're gonna go and you're gonna run a command to list out your Docker containers and you're gonna say, well, where is my Docker container? It's not running. You know, it says that it started, it was up for four seconds and it stopped. <laughs> That's not helpful. And it took me a while to, find, to figure out that you have to make sure that the command you run doesn't exit. So in this case, we're running Nginx with daemon off. So basically, we're running Nginx in the foreground um, so that it continues running and doesn't exit unless it crashes. Um, there are uh, a lot of different options you can do. Um, I've done things with containers where the process needed to be backgrounded, um, but uh, I would um, go ahead to make logging easier, I would run a process that effectively tailed a log file forever. Uh, and, that, and that became the output of my Docker container. As long as it was tailing that log file, then I could connect to that Docker container and just read the logs as they came out nice and live. Right? And, and using that kind of thing, you can actually be running multiple processes at runtime in your, in your container. So you can daemonize Nginx and maybe you want to have Nginx and Redis and all this inside one container instead of linking containers together. You can start all those things in the background and then run some command that lives forever, like tailing a log file. So that brings us to Vagrant, right? So we've looked at Docker and we say, okay, great. Docker's awesome. Um, it can containerize my application. All my dependencies live in there. Uh, e everything that is going to be done to spin up this container is defined right there in a Docker file, so we're all on the same page about what it is. That Docker file can be versioned with my repository for, so that as I add new dependencies to my application, I can also add run commands to install them inside my Docker container. And that can all live together really nicely. Um, Vagrant is about setting up awesome development environments by effectively automating virtual machines. Okay? So Vagrant, uh, Vagrant runs virtual machines using providers. So it supports multiple virtual machine providers so that you're not locked into one technology. Okay? Vagrant is open source and free. You can install it, run it. Um, and out of the box, it wants to work with VirtualBox, which is a free virtualization platform from Oracle. Uh, and it works, VirtualBox works pretty well. Um, I've had a lot of good experience running, the, running VMs with that, and it performs pretty well. Um, if you're a VMware guy, it'll work with VMware, um, either VMware Fusion or VMware Workstation. Um, on Windows, it'll actually support Hyper-V, so you can run your uh, if you're in an all Windows environment, you can, you know, to avoid having to install VirtualBox or anything else, if you just enable the Hyper-V role on your dev machines, then, virtual, then uh, Vagrant will be able to spin up virtual machines using Hyper-V. But most importantly, a, a fairly new addition to Vagrant as a VM provider is Docker. We know that guy. We just talked about him. That's what we wanted to use. So let's look at how we can use those together, right? So here is a Vagrant file, okay? And now you're gonna start saying, this kinda seems a lot like a Docker file. It's a file that describes how to spin up my VM. Okay, and that's right, that's what it is. Um, in this 
kind of basic Vagrant file here, we're defining some variables up at the top. Vagrant uses kind of a Ruby-ish syntax, so if you've got Ruby developers here, you'll, you'll recognize that stuff. Um, and the real meat happens here in this config.run method. So we come here and say, um, all right, the VM is going to be this box, this precise 32, which as you can imagine is an Ubuntu distribution. Um, it can, uh, we're going to tell it where to find this box, so that way it's like, hey, if I don't have this image already locally, go download it from this location. That can be anything. That can be something that's inside your corporate firewall if it needs to be, and, and it's a private image that your ops guys have already hardened as head and said, hey, this is the VM image we run on in production, so run on it in development too. Um, and then you can supply some host names, some IPs. Um, you can configure a lot of networking options. This one says host only, which basically means, all right, so this VM is only going to be exposed to my host machine, which is perfect for development. Um, you can actually expose it across to other resources if there's a reason for that. Um, and then you can customize the VM, um, depending on the VM provider you're using, based, and uh, tell it, hey, I want you to uh, increase the memory on this machine and you know, increase the hard disk or something like that. So if Docker is about spinning up virtual machines um, that are always consistent in both environments, and then Vagrant is kind of about using a virtual machine that's the same in all environments, why do you need both? Because hmm? Linux, that's why. Um, as we saw in the beginning, Docker is, is tied to LXC containers, which only work on the Linux kernel and only on you know fairly newer um, Linux kernels, um, 3.1 I think is where they introduced that. Um, and if your development environment is not Linux, how are you going to run a Docker container, <laughs> right? Uh, if you're if you're developing on a Mac like I do or on a Windows box, then how are you going to run these LXC containers and have that nice consistent environment between everything? Well, that's where Vagrant comes in. Because Vagrant has support for Docker as a VM provider, um, and I'm putting that in quotes because it's not exactly the same as the other VM providers for, for VirtualBox, but, um, which comes all the way back to how we talked about LXC containers are like virtual machines, but they're technically not. Um, so what Vagrant will do is if you define Docker images for Vagrant to run as its virtual machines, It'll say, all right, great. When you say Vagrant up to spin up these virtual machines, I'm going to look at the environment I'm in. If I'm on Linux and it supports LXC containers, then bam, I'm just going to fire up Docker as is, ready to go. Beautiful. If you're on Mac or Windows, it's going to, in the background, spin up a host virtual machine that's running a version of Linux that's compatible with Docker. And then it's going to push those Docker images into that VM but it's going to do it transparently so they just feel like they're running like they would if you were on Linux. So this becomes really nice in that you can say, okay, great, um, we're running Docker containers in production, we've got these Docker containers defined, and now I can develop inside these Docker containers on whatever environment I'm on, right? If, it's, uh, if I'm on a Mac, if I'm on Windows, no problem. Vagrant up right there from the repository of my Vagrant file, and it'll spin up the virtual machine if it needs it, and start spinning up Docker containers. Say, all right, cool. So let's look at a, a real world example, okay? So this is gonna be a set of a, a, a subset of some stuff that I did for a project recently where we were building out um, a Node.js webhook server that could just listen for webhooks from another system, um, a background worker that could run some background jobs, um, and it had dependencies of a, uh, a Redis server for caching, um, a RabbitMQ server for some queuing stuff, and, and a database. I think we're using Postgres on this one. Um, so I need all those things in my environment, right? And traditionally, that means, okay, great, if you're setting, up, setting yourself up to develop on this project, it means, great, step one, go install Redis, go install Postgres, go install 
you know, RabbitMQ, get all those configured, get all those working correctly, install Node.js, okay, great. Now you're ready to try to run the app. Um, oh, don't forget to npm install or the app's not gonna run. Um, by setting this up, and this is an example Docker file from the uh, webhook server um, that we ran in this app, I was able to define all this stuff so where it's gonna run inside of a Docker container. So we'll look here, this is where I told you I don't recommend this approach. I don't recommend it because I've tried it and I didn't like it. Um, I started from a Docker file that is kind of a base Node.js image that already has Node.js installed and ready to run and on the path. Um, I would, in retrospect, I would go back and start from a more base Ubuntu image and control the Node.js install myself so that I know exactly what version and where it's coming from and how it's happening. And that kind of stuff will also make your ops people very happy. Ops people don't like black boxes that are gonna run in their production environment. They wanna know what's going on in here, right? Um, and so I would much rather have this have a bunch of run commands that are running app get install or pulling the Node.js source and compiling it, whatever your company or whatever your personal preference is for how to get that set up. But I didn't do that. Um, now I was using a tool called PM2. How many people have used PM2 here? Yeah, it's people. Um, PM2 is uh, kind of like Node Forever for running Node.js apps in a cluster type environment. Um, but it, rather than trying to have to go put the Node cluster code inside your app yourself, it does it all for you. It's really cool. Um, but it doesn't really matter much for the context of this. The point is, that's what we were using to run our app. So I set an environment variable that tells PM2 I want you to bind to all available addresses. Um, as part of our run command, I'd say, okay, first I, knew I need to install PM2 if that's my dependency, so we're gonna install it globally. Um, and then we're going to run a command called PM2 web, right? Um, that is something that will run in the background um, on, on system startup if you set the flag, which I forgot to put into this file, um, that will let you get some stats about PM2 and how it's running remotely. Um, very interesting part here is I'm saying, okay, add, add my package.json file into this slash app directory that's inside my container, right? That's where all my code is. That's where I copied all my code into, which you'll see how that happens in the Vagrant file next. Um, so add that in, go into that work directory and run npm install. So now I'm saying, great, look at my package.json file and install all my dependencies. And again, the package.json, the Docker file, all this is versioned in my repository ready to go. Now, this is all Node.js stuff, because that's what I do mostly. Same thing applies to uh, if you're doing Ruby and you're going to run, uh, you know, you're going to have your gem file in there and you're going to run a bundle install. You're going to install RVM first, whatever, and install your Ruby versions. All these same concepts apply to getting your VM set up to run your Ruby code or your Python code or, you know, your Go code, whatever it is that you're running inside this VM. Now, I remind you, these are LXC containers, so they're Linux based. And you can run .NET in there too if you're .NET dev. Um, if you're using Mono, um, I have actually seen a guy named Paul Stack did a demo up in Kansas City about how to deploy an ASP.NET application inside of a Docker container on Mono. Whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know because I haven't tried it, but it's possible. So we're gonna set up what our environment needs to look like for this app. Um, I'm going to uh, expose a couple of ports that I want the outside world to be able to get to, okay? So here I've said expose port 3000 and port 9615, all right? Um, the reason I chose those is because 9615 is the port that goes with this PM2 web command so I can inspect my PM2 process remotely. Um, but the more interesting part from the application development standpoint is the port is exposing port 3000, all right? I intend to run my application on port 3000. Um, and so I want to expose that out to the outside world. Or at least that's what I thought when I wrote this Docker file. It was like the first Docker file I ever wrote. So we all like to learn from other people's mistakes, right? You don't actually need this line, all right? If you're getting started in Docker and you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna run my app on port 3000, I better expose port 3000. Well, that's not true. Um, that was a big point of confusion for me for a long, long time when I started off with Docker, was trying to figure out how the port mapping stuff pieced together, 
and what this expose thing was and why do I have to define the port I'm going to run on in advance? I want to pass that in with an environment variable or something, right? The expose command is about exposing ports to other Docker containers, okay? So in, in the example earlier where we looked at the Redis container, right? Redis by default runs on port 6379. The Redis Docker file is going to include a file, a, 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 um, a, an expose command that says expose 6379, right? And that way it knows that anytime I link one container to that container, it's going to expose that port on its IP, and that's how all those environment variables we saw got generated, right? It's based on this. You don't need this if you're for, for just running your application. You only need this if, your if the port that your application exposes needs to be consumed by another Docker container, all right? Um, so then I've got um, a work directory here which says, hey, all the rest of the commands I run after this are gonna be run inside this working directory. Um, and that's all stuff that runs at build time. So when I go Docker build, build my container, it goes and runs all of this stuff and has it all set to go, right? When I actually run the, the container in dev or in prod, it runs this command, it run, which is my command here, and it says, okay, I'm running PM2 start, here's my file, I want you to watch for changes and run it in no daemon mode so it doesn't exit. I lost an entire day of productivity trying to figure out why my Docker container would start and immediately stop. And there was no bugs in the code because it was just hello world. I was like, the app's not crashing, what's going on? Oh, then I found out you can't run, a, run it as a background process, it's gotta be a foreground process. So, this is the Vagrant file that goes with that Docker image as well as some other one. Now this is a lot to take in, so we're gonna go through it a little bit slowly, but it's gonna help piece all this together in a real world example. So, to start our Vagrant file up here, um, I have, this is some Ruby stuff that, frankly, I didn't even understand the syntax because I'm not a Ruby guy. I saw it somewhere else, I copied it, I pasted it, I modified it to my needs um, because that's development, right? And uh, I, um, so this is basically just defining a, essentially kind of a string literal that can be uh, executed as a script, uh, that I'm going to execute as a script. So I come down here into our Vagrant config. Now, here we're gonna see something interesting that you don't see in a lot of your getting started Vagrant files. I'm actually gonna have Vagrant spin up two different machines for me. Um, so I will tell it, first off, I'm gonna spin up a box called services, right? This is meant to run all the stuff that I consider to be external to my application, right? Because that's how you would do it in production, right? You're, you're, you're very likely going to have a database server over there and a Redis server over there, right? And a RabbitMQ server over there, or maybe you're using them from the cloud, right? So I wanted to make sure that I understood how I could get my Docker containers to link together because when I looked at the first, when I first went through the sample for linking Docker containers, the first thing that jumped out at me was like, hey, wait a second, that means everything has to run on the same box, right? How do I tell it that this container I want to link to is on a different box? Because that's going to be the environment we really have to run in, and I want to make sure that we're ready for that. Um, and that's what this Vagrant file ends up helping me learn and helping me do. So this Vagrant file to spin up our services box, I started with a base Ubuntu box that's put out by the Fusion Passenger guys. Um, I established a private network with a static IP address for it. Um, I forwarded some ports from the guest virtual machine to the host virtual machine, right? Uh, and this is the uh, RabbitMQ port that I'm gonna run on. Um, and then I say, okay, VM provision Docker, right? So now here I'm using Docker as a provisioner not a virtual machine provider. There's two different ways, and this gets a little confusing with Vagrant, right? Um, and to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't use this, this approach again, okay? But it can still help us learn a lot about how Docker containers le link together, okay? Um, I would use Docker as a provider, 
Right now I'm using VirtualBox as a provider and running Docker containers inside my own image. So I've said, spin me up this Ubuntu box, forward these ports to it, and then provision it with Docker. And I'm telling, okay, for Docker, I want you to go pull these images. So it's gonna go look out at that repository, at the Docker hub, and it's gonna pull these images that I defined, this RabbitMQ image, a Redis image, and this thing called Ambassador, all right? And we'll get into that Ambassador here in just a minute because that's the part that lets us run and link containers across boxes. So then I tell it, great, so on the services box, run my RabbitMQ image um, and pass in an environment variable that is RabbitMQ password because this RabbitMQ image, the author told me that it, uh, or put it in their documentation, that it expects a uh, environment variable that lets you define the password for authenticated RabbitMQ. Um, so I'm establishing that here. And in production, the guys can, the ops guys can run their own instance of RabbitMQ in a Docker container and specify their password there, and I don't have to know it. Um, and then I also spin up the Redis instance, and again, I set a Redis password. Um, I pass in a few environment variables to tell it how I want it to work. I want you to use no more than 128 megs of memory on this Redis instance. You know, evict keys with a least recently used. Um, so that spins up both of those images on this services box. But I need to be able to access them from my app box that we're going to spin up in just a minute. Well, that's where the ambassador comes in. When you, when you look at how to, excuse me, how to link containers across boxes, you'll find that people will recommend you to use uh, what they refer to as the ambassador pattern, um, which effectively means uh, proxying calls. Um, so this ambassador image um, is made to basically uh, listen on whatever ports, uh, on all ports, and forward commands to their link containers on those same ports, right? So in here, I'm spinning this up and saying, great, um, I want you to link this RabbitMQ ambassador to my RabbitMQ container as RabbitMQ, and I want you to map these ports that are gonna be used for communication between the containers, right? I'm expecting calls to come in on these ports, and I want you to do that. So this is saying, hey, my RabbitMQ is not actually exposed outside of my host machine. The ambassador is exposed outside of the host machine, listening for these calls and passing them down into RabbitMQ. Okay? And uh, I later figured out I could actually do this with just one ambassador and map all the ports and they didn't need to be separate over here. But lessons learned. So I learned that lesson by spinning up a second one and realizing that I didn't need it. So let's look at our apps VM, okay? So this one, I'm spinning up a second box. This one again is an Ubuntu 14.04 box from the uh, Fusion Passenger guys. Um, I'm putting it on a network as well, exposing some ports that I want. Um, I know that I'm gonna run my application on port 3000 and I want to access that from my development VM, right? My development VM is the host for this for this vagrant virtual machine, and I want to expose the guest port to my host. And so that way I can just fire up my browser in my dev environment, say localhost 3000, and it's actually gonna go into my vagrant box. So now I'm no longer developing, I'm no, I'm no longer accessing the code that's running directly on my development box. It's running over here inside of vagrant VM. Um, I'm going to establish some synced folders. By default, Vagrant will take whatever folder your Vagrant file is in, which is probably the root of your repository, and it will automatically map it into your VM at slash Vagrant. Um, I'm gonna map some more specific things because I have a couple of different applications running here that I wanna map in. So I'm mapping my webhook server and my background worker, and I'm mapping those in as NFS shares and mapping them to these locations, right? So this is a directory off of my root repository where my Vagrant file is, and this is where I want it to be exposed inside the VM. So now I'm ready to provision my apps with Docker. Um, 
So this time, instead of pulling an image, I'm telling it, I want you to build an image, right? Because this is my code. I've got my Docker file defined and I want to go ahead and build this image. So I say, okay, great. Um, Docker, build this webhook server, give it this name and build it from the, from the Docker file that you find in this folder, right? So it's going to go in there, read our Docker file that we had right here and execute all this and build this container for us. And when we get done, it's going to be called shop and pal slash webhook server. Um, I'm going to do the same thing for the background worker. And once again, I'm going to pull in the ambassador image because I need to link to services that are on my other VM. So in the, uh, excuse me. In our, uh, when we go to run our different containers, um, down here at the bottom, you see where I'm running my app servers. But first, I'm going to run the ambassadors. Okay? So I first run a RabbitMQ ambassador here. Um, and I'm running it from this image. And I'm saying, expose these ports to other containers. Right, and that's that's like doing one of these expose commands here in the Docker file. So I say expose those ports, set this environment variable, right, that has the information about how to access RabbitMQ on the remote host. Now, once this is running, all right, once this is running, and it's going to be called RabbitMQ Ambassador, this can now act as an ambassador for any Docker containers running on this machine that need to access RabbitMQ, okay? So I can spin up one, two, 20 Docker containers, and if they need RabbitMQ, I can link them together with this ambassador that knows where to find RabbitMQ elsewhere on the network, right? So in dev, we're kind of, you know, it's all kind of hard-coded together, but in production, your ops guys will have set up RabbitMQ on some server somewhere else, right? In a Docker container, maybe standalone, you don't have to care. And they'll have on their Docker machine where they're gonna run your image, they'll have spun up this ambassador called RabbitMQ or RabbitMQ ambassador, however they wanna call it. And that way they can, when you say, hey, my Docker container needs to be linked to RabbitMQ at runtime, they'll say, okay, cool, they'll add that link command and you're gonna have access to that RabbitMQ instance wherever it is, and you don't have to care, you don't have to know. But in development, you can run the exact same image as they are. You can have the exact same topology that they're using. So I'm gonna also spin up a Redis ambassador doing the same thing. So now, this VM is prepared to offer Redis and RabbitMQ services that are elsewhere on the network to any of its Docker containers that are local. So when I spin up my webhook server, I tell it, great, spin it up from this image that we just built and pass in these arguments. Um, we're going to start by saying dash V. I'm telling Docker at runtime, I want you to take a folder that's on this host machine and map it inside my Docker container, right? Now this becomes powerful for development time because well, at runtime, my files are going to be kind of statically added into, at build time of my Docker container, the files that I want for my application are going to be statically added into my Docker container. But for development, I don't want that. My development files are constantly changing. And I don't want to have to rebuild the container every time I make a tiny code change, right? So by mapping this webhook server folder that's on our host VM, remember we mapped it right up here, straight out of our source repository. Um, inside this slash app slash source, I can now run my commands from inside there and say, okay, great. While I'm in development mode, we're actually gonna have a live file system in there um, that's running inside this Docker container and is synced between my development machine into my Docker container. Um, that way I can keep coding away and letting, you know, because I'm using PM2, PM2 watches for changes to files and automatically reloads your app, awesome. Now it's kind of like having live reload, right? I can just sit here and code away on my Node.js app, and every time I save a change, my app restarts inside my Docker container and it's ready to go. Um, 
Um, the, um, I'm also telling it, hey, my app, I know that my app that I wrote expects me to pass in a port environment variable to tell it what port it should be running on. So I'm passing that in here with a dash E flag, and then I'm mapping that from the Docker container out to my host machine. I'm also mapping this uh, PM2 web interface that's running inside my Docker container. And here's the fun part. I tell it, okay, great. I want you to link to the Redis ambassador and inside my container, I want you to call it Redis. Just like we did in the beginning when we linked to a Redis container. We said, hey, it's going to be called Redis and that's going to make all these specific environment variables get exposed. Well, that's going to happen here. And now these Redis ports are going to get exposed inside my container. And my container says, OK, cool. Now I know where to find Redis. It's, on, it's at this other ambassador container. And it's just going to send commands there. And it has no idea that the ambassador container is saying, oh, OK, well, I'm going to collect this and send it across the network to this other guy. Um, and then I do the same thing with my RabbitMQ to link those in. And now my webhook server is up and running. It's got access to RabbitMQ. It's got access to Redis. I could use this to link into a MySQL or Postgres database that's running in another container somewhere. Um, and I did the same thing with my background worker and linked it up. And both of those are now ready to go. Now I'm ready to develop my app. So what's going to happen here is when I get ready to develop, I have cloned down this repository. And in the root of this repository is a vagrant file. And in all these other folders are these Docker files. Mm -hmm. And my workflow becomes great. Um, I'm brand new. I'm a brand new developer, just came on your project. Yeah. You handed me, say, a MacBook Pro and said, all right, install your tools to be able to run this project. What you need to install is Vagrant and VirtualBox. Install those two things. And now clone the repository and say Vagrant up. Vagrant up is going to go through this file and set up both of those host VMs that we just talked about. It's going to pull those Docker images in. It's going to recreate a development environment in virtual machines that looks almost exactly like what your production environment looks like. And you only had to install two things on your dev box. Right? And now you're sitting there with your favorite code editor open and you're writing code right there on your dev box. And those code changes are being auto magically synced into your Docker container and reloading, right? So now you're building an app and when you get done building this feature and get ready to ship it, you say, yeah, it's done. Just go grab the latest Docker file and build the image because everything from a dependency standpoint, if you added any new dependencies, if you added a requirement in there, you would have added all this into your Docker file to make it work in dev. And guess what? That exact same thing is what's gonna get run in test and in prop. And now you've kind of achieved that sort of development nirvana of, great, when I write my code here, I know, I know that it's going to work out there, right? I, and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, sure, let's do continuous delivery. Let's deploy to production. I don't know. Sure, do it in the middle of the night. I don't care. I'm not going to get woke up to fix a bug because I know the stuff works. It gives you a lot of confidence in the code that you write and in shipping that code. And it builds a lot of trust. Right? and communication between the development team and the ops team. Right? All of a sudden, everybody's on the same page. There's none of this throwing it over the wall saying, well, I don't know, we did this in dev, what did you install in ops? You don't have that. Right? You have, hey, here's the file, here's the Docker file that describes everything that was done, both in dev and in ops. Right? Let's collaborate on this. Hey, ops guys, why isn't this working when my Docker file tries to run? And they look at it and say, oh, because you're trying to access app git and we blocked that in the prod firewall. Uh, now they know, oh, I'll go open that up or they'll tell you a different source to do it. But everything will end up being in the Docker file so that it always works the same everywhere. Uh, and the last line of this is just a VM provisioner this, that runs our start script we defined at the top that basically just says, every time I vagrant up, if you've already built the images, make sure that they're running. So we go Docker start all of these things. Okay. So, you guys have questions about that stuff? <laughs> okay. Yes? Can you talk about the difference between dev and prod? Um, are those different favorite files or are those different Docker files? Or uh, yeah, great question. So the question is, what's the difference between dev and prod? Is it different Docker files, different Vagrant files? Um, so 
uh, production uh, doesn't know or care about a vagrant file. That's a development time thing. That is for spinning up a VM in your development or testing environment, right? That, and that VM is intended to be a replication of the host machine that's in production, right? Um, so in, in, our, in our Vagrant file here, this is running on the assumption that I, you know, I don't care about the services box because that is stuff that's external to my application, but I do care about the fact that there is a box called apps that can run Docker, and that's all I care about, right? So Vagrant is only there to help facilitate the running of these Docker containers, okay? Now, the Docker files are exactly the same between uh, between dev and production or whatever, uh, because you actually build an artifact from the Docker file, right? So the way that you, the process you would go through after defining a Docker file is um, typically you will probably want to build that image, whether you build it on the dev box, on a CI server, um, Docker Hub actually will automatically watch for changes in a GitHub repo and build your Docker file for you right there on their registry public or private, so you can keep those things locked down. Um, and at the end of that, what you'll end up with is it has followed all those instructions and created a base image that is effectively a VM that can be run on any Docker host, okay? And that VM is what actually gets run in production or in development, okay? And so that's where you see um, when we do things like uh, run this uh, Docker, where I tell it to pull images by their name here, if I have built an image called Shop and Pal webhook server and pushed it to some private Docker repository, whether that's the one that Docker runs or even a file share or something, um, then you can say, great, Docker pull, and it's going to pull that image down to your production server. And it's going to be the exact same image that was built in dev and whatever, wherever else, right? It's, the, it's kind of the, uh, the concept of build once, run everywhere, right? It's going to have all the information so that that image is ready to run and anything that needs to be passed to that image that's environment specific gets passed on the command line, right? At the time that you're actually executing it in the environment where it needs to be, right? And by the people who need to know that information, right? As a developer, I just need to know, hey, my Docker file um, specifies that my Docker image is going to need uh, to be linked to Redis. Production guys, when you run it, you know where the Redis is, and you know the Redis password. You put it in there, and I don't have to know it, right? Does that clear it up any? It's, it's a really, there's like so many layers, it's like inception of virtual machines, because you're like, well, I got a dead machine, and then it's got virtual machines, and then it's got Linux containers, and then you're, you know, you're too many levels deep, and you're looking for your little spinning thing, so you can make sure you're not crazy yet. But at the end of it, what you end up with in production is just Docker run some image, right? And so your Docker host is just a box, whether that's a virtual machine, a you know real box, wherever it is, something you're running in AWS. It's just a Linux box with Docker installed, and all you do is say, hey, Docker, go grab this image that I built and run it for me, right? And you know that that image was built consistently, okay? Yes? If you're not using Vagrant, Right, so um, I would that that's a reason that I would still use Vagrant, right, while developing, because it's going to give you some options um, around being able to set up these synced folders and such, right? So that's saying, hey, at development time, even if I'm on a Linux box, right, and my Docker containers are going to be spun up directly as LXC containers on my box, Vagrant will still go through and say, hey. But before you do that, or when you do that, once that machine is up, link this folder on my dev environment inside my Docker container, right? And that's something that doesn't happen in production. That happens at development because you just want the live files in there, right? But at build time, when you get ready to ship that container, it's gonna take a snapshot of those files. And that's what's gonna be shipped with your container, is, hey, at the time that I built it, it looked exactly like this. Does that make sense? Yes. So let me get wrap my head around this some more. Right now I've got a Git repository on my dev box. Mm -hmm. I've got Git on my production. Mm -hmm. 
push from my dev, then I get on production, I pull it down. Okay. Now we're we're what? We're pushing up the entire Docker file and pulling down the entire Docker file. Um, all right. So the question is, he his development environment looks like this. He's got Git on his local machine. He also has Git on his production server. And the workflow that you're looking for is, I'm done committing here, I push it to my remote Git repository, right? Or, or I log into that repository or that, that server and I do a Git pull. So I'm pulling down the full development repository here. In that scenario, you would build your Docker container in production, right? Because you have the full set of uh, source code files sitting there, you wouldn't need Vagrant once you got out there, but what you would, your, your, source your host machine in production would have Docker installed, and since you pulled down all of your dev files with your Docker file, you would say, Docker build, and point it to your Docker file, and it's gonna create that image right there locally, and from there, you would go Docker run the image you just built, okay? Um, so that's, the, that, and that's kind of the workflow you use if you don't wanna push to a, uh, a, a Docker registry. Uh, but one thing I did note that just recently I found out, the official Docker registry, which I always thought was public only, um, actually offers private repos now. You can get one for free, I think. And it's kind of a GitHub style pricing. You get one for free, you get five for seven bucks, you know, that type of thing. Um, so you can actually host your private stuff that you don't want the world to see that's in a private GitHub repo somewhere um, out there on the Docker registry. And that would let you say, okay, great. Whenever I check in, there's going to be a build server. Um, I've been using a service called Shippable lately that will, whenever I do a check in on GitHub, it'll go grab my source files, do a build, run my tests, make sure everything's working, and then push that to the Docker registry for me. So. How big are the images? Uh, excellent question. How big are the images? So um, it uses a, a, a very Git-like differential system. Um, and that's where, if you see in our, back in the very beginning of our runs, um, back on slide number one, where it said this, and then I went dot, 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 then download complete. There was actually about 14 things in here, all right? So the, the inside of Docker, the way it works is every time you build an image, that creates a what they call a layer, right? And every time that you say, okay, if my Docker file says um, from Debian Wheezy, Debian Wheezy, that basically is pointing at a layer. This thing is going to have its own set of layers. And every time I say, great, build this Docker file, it basically goes back and says, all right, well, what are all the layers I need? Let me pull down each individual one. So they vary in size. Some layers are a kilobyte. Some layers are 800 megabytes, depending on what's in there. That's one of the reasons why I recommend you start from kind of as high up the tree as you can and say, only put in what I need, right? Uh, now, the nice part is that once you pull down a Docker image so that it's ready to run, you can tell it to remove those intermediate images and it'll automatically ditch any of them that it doesn't actually need for your final image. That way it kind of helps control your disk space a little bit so you don't get out of control on that. But, uh, yes? So you have examples of multiple virtual machines locally with Vagrant. Mm -hmm. Is there a corresponding setup that can automate the deployment of multiple servers? So you have a Vagrant file where you have five different machines running, mm -hmm. and you want to deploy to five different uh, uh, digital ocean droplets or different C2 right. instances. Um, do you have to use Vagrant locally and check remotely, or is there a way you can have one setup that is managed on both? Excellent question. So the question is, in that scenario where I've got multiple VMs in my Vagrant file that are running all these different things, how does that translate to the multiple VMs in production? If you're the guy who's on both sides of that, how do you manage that? Um, there's about a thousand different ways. <laughs> but what I would recommend, if, if you're already a chef guy, right, and, or a chef girl, or a chef person, then um, you, can, uh, you can use chef, because when you go to provision your Vagrant machines, um, you can specify provisioners. I've only used a shell provisioner here and Docker, but you can actually say, oh, here's a set of chef recipes that I want you to run on this machine, right? And that can be the same set of recipes that's shared with production, right? So you can run the exact, if, you're, if your ops team has already written a bunch of chef scripts to, product, to, to, to provision those servers, you can say, hey, let me point at those, and I'm gonna use the exact same scripts to set up my Vagrant machine, so I'm using the exact same thing between here and there. If it's Puppet, Vagrant supports Puppet, 
you can do that, right? You can, if you've got shell scripts that provision it, you can use those out there and here. So the idea being that however it is you provision your production environment, if you can do the exact same thing for Vagrant, which supports most of the common scenarios, Vagrant supports Chef, Puppet, um, Chef Solo, Puppet Standalone, Ansible, um, Docker, there's, there's a whole list on their website at vagrantup.com of all the provisioners that they support. And so you look through there and say, ah, I'm an Ansible guy. I got Ansible scripts all over production. I'm just gonna point my Vagrant file at those and have it spin up my VMs to look exactly like production. Right? You had a question back there? Yeah, these are just following up so it's like, so I've got all this stuff on my local machine mm -hmm. and I'm running an EC2 or a DigitalOcean or whatever software and I will build this Docker thing Mm -hmm. and sync that to my production machine somehow, whether it's in Git or whatever. Yes. And then on that, which is already running a Ubuntu thing, it's gonna, I'm going to run the Docker on that thing. Yes. Spin up that thing on the Ubuntu image on Amazon services, and then that's the application. Yes, okay. that is correct. So the, the, to, to, to summarize that, it was basically um, the, you would need to be running Docker on your production box whatever that is, right? If you've got some machine somewhere that you can SSH into somehow, um, it's a virtual machine, it's an EC2 image, it's a hard box sitting in a data center somewhere, um, it's you know a, a laptop that's sitting next to you, whatever your production machine is. Um, you can uh, you SSH in there, you install <laughs> Docker, app git install Docker IO, right? Or yum install Docker IO, depending on your distribution. Um, as long as your distribution has a kernel that can support Docker, you install Docker there, so now you've got that Docker command line tool. And now it's simply about doing one of two things. Either pulling an image from some remote repository, right? So if you have built, like I said before, and pushed to the Docker hub, you can pull your image down from there, whether it's public or private. Or, as we discussed before, maybe your workflow involves shipping all of your source code to production and so you just run your Docker build there, and that image only exists locally on your machine. You say, okay, great, Docker build, run it. That scenario will work fine if you're, um, and, and it'll be repeatable, so even if you do that on multiple servers, it'll still work, but you gotta go run, you gotta go build the image on each server in that scenario, and then run it. If you build it once and push it to some kind of a registry somewhere, whether that's inside <laughs> your firewall, the hub, wherever, um, then you can go to each one of your machines or have a, Ansible or Chef or Puppet Script that on your machines says, hey, Docker, pull these images and run them. Now it can go get it from a single source. Okay. Yes? Where, where did the logs go? The ones that are generated inside by processes inside the <coughs> um, So Docker uh, kind of collects those up to the host machine level. Um, and you can run uh, a command, Docker logs, and pass it either an image ID or a, or I'm sorry, a, uh, an instance ID or the actual name if you named your instance when you ran it. And you can um, turn around from there and, um, and view those logs and even tail the logs as they go live. So they come back out. Map where the it, yeah, it maps them from inside the Docker container and pulls them up out of the thing, uh, out of the Docker container to the host machine. So, right? Um, all right, one last question and then I think we're out of time. Yes? Have you heard of something called long short and it comes to finish this? Uh, okay, so I heard of it, yes, like I like in passing, and I don't know. Based on the title, I'm gonna guess it's for managing Docker containers, um, but I don't know what it does. So, sorry, can't help. All right, uh, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much.